And now, AM650 presents your source for leading-edge news and information on today's hottest products and services. This is Experts on Call on AM650. Well, welcome to Experts on Call here on AM650. It's always a great hour when we have Phil Moriarty, the owner of the BC Canine Training Center, join us and to talk about dogs for the hour. Phil, good to see you again. Great to see you too. Thanks for coming by. Uh, lots of lots to talk about here, and I suppose we should begin by telling folks about the BC Canine Training Center. I'll start with the location. That's the easy part. It's right down there at the foot of Number 3 Road, as far down, quite literally, in Richmond, as far as you can go on Number 3 Road. So that means below uh, Steveston Highway, right there at the Fraser River. You've got five acres of ideal conditions, lots of big pens and open spaces for the dogs to run and go through their training protocols. How long have you been there in that location? Mm, 13 years. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you're a former police officer with right. uh, Vancouver and Delta Police Forces. That's right. And during your time as a uniformed officer with Delta, you were uh, you were uh, attached to, or you had a canine uh, unit attached to you. You're a dog cop. That's right. Jesse was my dog. Okay. And then you went to Vancouver City and became a, de a detective. Right. Yeah. And then out of the police career, uh, you decided to go into animal uh, training. And what was the connection? How did you get out of the police work uh, after decades of service to the community and decide to carry on serving the community in a different way? Well, I guess if you're going to leave something, you might as well take the best of what you, uh, what, what you experienced when you were there, and I just loved the logs. Okay. So uh, if I'm now into retirement or semi-retirement and left the policing, um, I love dogs. So let's do something with them. Absolutely. Uh, i got to uh, just remind people, because when we talk about dogs and training, especially when we talk about police dogs, we usually see really handsome German shepherds, and they all look like they've been you know, bred for generations specifically for this task. When you were a Delta cop with your dog, you had a rescue dog from an SPCA shelter, didn't you? Well, it wasn't a rescue. It was uh, from the SPCA, but it was a dog that was just far too much for the um, family to handle. Okay. It just, uh, you know, lots and lots of dog there. And uh, when he got big, they, they just couldn't handle him. How often does that happen, Phil? Uh, too it, often. Yeah, when, when you just when you know you want a dog and it's the right thing and it's the right time for the family, but you just overextend or make a bad decision and pick the wrong dog. It, in the case of the family who had your police dog before you, it was just too rambunctious. There was too much dog for, for those folks. Does that happen frequently? It happens far too often. Yeah, people don't seem to think through. Uh, you know, puppies are cute. Exactly. And, and they're small. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have an image in their mind of what the what the dog is going to be. So they're running this videotape and they're in their head of what their perceived uh, future is going to be. Right. And then the reality sets in that the dog is now uh, close to 100 pounds and and uh, all the little kids can't handle it. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the proper training, so they don't know really what makes the dog tick and I uh, can't control it. Uh, and, it and, becomes too much for the household. Well, that's it. And, and uh, size has a lot to do with if there are little kids in the family and a large, rambunctious dog, that's uh, chemistry that doesn't always work out, uh, isn't it? it? Especially if the dog doesn't have room to play. Right. If, if it doesn't have room to run off the energy, then it, it's going to run it off in different ways. And not just with the kids, though. I, you know, the the owners, the the parents, oftentimes are incapable of of um, handling the dog. Mm -hmm. They just don't know what to do. Right. Well, I'll give I'll give me another example of not knowing what to do. The dog doesn't matter what the size of the dog is, but the dog is basically by itself because the owners uh, go to work every day and leave the dog in the house. And there's always food and water and maybe even a little doggy door that he can go out to the balcony on or whatever. But it's basically alone mm -hmm. from 7.38 in the morning until 5.36 in the evening. Mm -hmm. And uh, the owners are noticing that uh, uh, during the hot summer days, they're coming home and there's more and more things in the house, uh, well, are getting destroyed. Uh, it was a pillow. It was a slipper. Mm -hmm. And now it was 
one of my good shoes, and uh, who knows what it's going to be next. E even more in the not hot summer days, because uh, the dogs could go outside during True. the summertime, where the, the inclination would be to keep them inside in the winter. But there's a there's a pattern of destructive behavior beginning to develop, and it's pretty recognizable. It's tough to miss when an animal's chewing up your house. So how do you remedy that, Phil? Well, first of all, it's frustration. Of course. And the dog, again, you, you've got an animal that needs to expend energy. And if it doesn't expend it one way, it'll expend it another way. Right. Uh, lots of times uh, the um, the dog focuses on barking. It'll bark in incessantly. Drive the neighbors nuts. And it's barking only now because it's barking. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't know why it's barking anymore. It just knows that now it's time to bark. Right, right. And not really understand why. It, it's uh, almost uh, like, you know, some people chew their fingernails. Mm -hmm. They don't know why they're chewing their fingernails. They, they just absentmindedly chewing their fingernails, and True. then they get engrossed in it. Mm -hmm. um, same thing can happen with, uh, w with food items around the house. They'll start sniffing for it, and that, that, that'll be their, their thing. They, you know, th there's the garbage. Uh, or some toy, a slipper, or something right, right. like that. Well, uh, you, can, you can intellectualize all you want about, well, that's daddy's, and he smells daddy. And yeah, he yeah, 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 no. It's, it's something that he can gnaw on, right. and, and that's a pacifier. And the, boy, the dog basically is bored right out of its tree, It's right? a pacifier. Right. Yeah. And so all they're doing is indulging in some behavior to keep themselves occupied during those many long, boring hours with them by themselves. Sure. If you were alone at home for hours at a time, and, and you couldn't change the channel. You couldn't change it. You couldn't even turn the TV on. Right. Let alone change it. And uh, you, you're not supposed to be going into any cupboards, and you're not supposed to be uh, jumping up on any furniture. Right. Or, you know, what would you be doing? Finding ways to misbehave. Amuse, your, uh, amuse yourself, <laughs> right? That's right. So, and, you know, pe people have to be active, and animals have to be active. So is there anything that... Uh, w how do you remedy this, Phil? Do they is is there a training program at the BC Canine Training Center where you can bring one of these lonely, bored dogs and put them through a week or two of, of behavioral classes and so on to improve how they manage that those empty hours uh, while you're away? What is there? How do you well, the train training, them out of destroying your house? Well, the training can can uh, help you. Um, get the dog not to go to places that it's not allowed to go. Okay, right. Uh, but it's not going to change the boredom. Mm -hmm. So you need to be doing things that are, are um, you know, it, enclosing the dog in an area that is going to have uh, some, um, some brain work to be able to uh, carry itself through the day without mm -hmm. being destructive. But if it's uh, not working, you, you want to have it in a room where it can't really be destroying things. Uh, but the training is going to be more for um, uh, the owner and how you engage with the dog. Right. Uh, the training is going to be also more for um, you when you're around the dog. I mean, if you can't control, if you can't uh, reinforce the behavior once the dog has been told to do something because you're not there, right. then it becomes counterproductive then the behavior that you're trying to correct uh, is allowed to continue and you're not, not, not there to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the ideal situation would be is not to uh, necessarily think that the training is going to work, but the daycare would work. Right. Or the boarding. Right. Okay. So that if you're not going to be there and you don't have another animal for the, for the dog to play with, uh, you know, daycare is a great option for, for people who, um, need their dogs to get the exercise they need and interact with other animals. Now, does the BC Canine Training Center offer daycare options? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you could, in this case, because, you know, the other uh, other option that some people would consider is dog walkers. Have uh, somebody come by and pick up the dog and take it to a, a off-leash park or whatever dog walkers mm -hmm. do for a couple of hours. And then there's that socialization with other dogs. There's the exercise. There's some kind of activity to, to, uh, to take away the boredom. But not everyone can afford that. Well, that, that leads to our training. Uh, a lot of dog walkers have um, ruined enough dogs that uh, the people have to bring them back to us to uh, get retrained if they were trained. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, p part of having an animal I is having a commitment. Right. 
And if uh, it's just a show toy, or if it's just uh, something that's convenient for you uh, when you're around, uh, it doesn't really help the dog's lifestyle. Right. Um, so if the if you're hiring a uh, pet walker mm -hmm. or a dog walker, uh, what experience do they have in the proper procedure for handling a dog and making sure that whatever training the dog had, it it, uh, it, it keeps right. and, and doesn't break down. I've got a dog that's in for outboard training right now that is being retrained because um, um, the dog walker didn't know what she was doing. And now the dog is uncontrollable when the owner takes it out. Oh, I see. So it's So back to back square in, one. Well, close to square one. Um, but at least the learning curve is uh, uh, much less steep than it was, you know, originally. When, when the dog was novice. When push comes to shove in, the, in those two categories, either a daycare option, Phil, drop the dog off, pick him up on the way home from work, or employ a dog walker, which of the two is likely to be more costly, or do they end up being about the same? Probably uh, about the same if, uh, I don't know what dog walkers charge. Yeah, neither uh, do I. But a half day with us is 10 bucks, and a full day is, uh, is 20 bucks. So uh, a half day is five hours or less. Right. So if you're dropping the dog off for five hours worth of uh, play with other dogs and um, uh, lots of energy because it has, uh, or lots of places to expend the energy. you got five acres out there to run around on. Yeah, and we separate the runs so that, um, you know, compatible dogs go with compatible dogs. Right. And, and what if your dog is particularly kind of snooty and incompatible with just about everything else on four legs? Well, it, it, it finds something that's compatible. They're... They're a pack animal. Uh -huh. And so, uh, you know, you, you find the water that is uh, sufficiently tepid for the dog. Right. And, and so, again, maybe we're over-intellectualizing when it comes to this, our dogs and their feelings and, and how well they socialize with other dogs. I think we think too much about some of that stuff, don't you? Um, yeah. We, we, we not only think too much about it, but we try to do something about it. Right. It's counterproductive. Okay. Um, people bring their dogs in for, for, for training and say, I can't take him for a walk. He, he just, um, uh, you know, it's always pulling on the leash. Right. And every time it sees another dog, he wants to jump at it and all that sort of, well, th th there are proper ways to let dogs introduce themselves to one another. And, mm -hmm. and, um, you're just adding a whole bunch of tension to the dog all the way down that leash because you're anticipating something bad is going to happen and the dog's not going to uh, disappoint. Yeah. I, I, you know, this happens all the time, though. Phil, I was driving home from work just yesterday afternoon, and I saw a lady, a smallish lady, and a largish dog. And it was a real challenge as to determine who was taking who for a walk. Because she was, this dog was giving her a heck of a workout, and she was pulling, and it was a chore for her. And no one was having fun. The dog wasn't having, it was chomping and sweating and tonguing on the woman. And the pulling, was, the pulling was, just leads to more pulling. Oh, I know. And I'm thinking, you know, and she's trying to do the right thing. She's trying to give her dog some exercise time on the leash. Mm -hmm. But it was just a tug of war, and it really looked uncomfortable for both parties. Mm -hmm. Could be a couple of things going on. One, one is, uh, you know, get a dog that's appropriate for you. Uh, get a dog that you can manage. Uh, if the dog was trained... Uh, there's a good possibility that uh, just a, a word command would keep the dog by your side mm -hmm. because you tell it to heal. Right. Um, and, and if it didn't, you need to be able to give it a sufficient sufficient correction so that the dog understands that uh, what it just tried to do, it can't do anymore. Right. And uh, most people convert that into a pulling. So, you know, the dog feels the tension on the leash. Oh, I guess there is something to what I've been trying to do. So I have to pull harder to get to where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And the owner, of course, is pulling harder because they think they have to pull harder to stop the dog from where he wants to go. And there you have the tug of war. Yeah. And, and neither one of them communicating. Right. Uh, except one is feeding the other. I have to pull harder now because he's pulling harder. Now he's pulling harder because I'm pulling harder. And it's time for the human in the equation to stop for a moment and go, wait a second, who's in charge here? Who's the dog and who's the person? If the person did that first, then there wouldn't be that problem. Right. Yeah. So you, you have to make a decision when you when you get an animal. Am, am I going to be in charge of it or is the animal going to be in charge of me? So... You know, it's not one of those things where you, you go to a grocery store, you see a shelf full of dogs, and you say, oh, that's a cute one, I'll take this one. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, 
uh, but the dog is three times your size and it doesn't know how strong it is. All it knows is that I want to walk. To it. So he, he may not even feel he's pulling. All he's doing is walking and you can't control it. That's right, yeah. Um, and so the, the, there are a number of things that should be considered before selecting the type of dog that you're going to um, love. Right, and, and you know, uh, uh, being the person, being the human, and being in charge doesn't mean that you love your dog any less. It's just that you recognize who's who in the equation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Some people that they, well, yeah, I wouldn't want to be too dominant, you know. I, I come off, you're the person. You got to be. Somebody got to call the commands. Well, there's, there, there's two things. One is the love, and the other is the obedience. Right. And obedience comes from respect. The dog can love you to death and not respect you. Right. What good is the dog being loved and, and uh, not doing anything you say? Because you don't know how to control it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you're not going to take the ownership of it to where the dog is, is going to live a much more comfortable life. With somebody when, in charge. When he feels that he's with somebody who's A, in charge. Right. And B, who he, he will love even more because the bond has been created. I mean, you can take a, a, a dog and say, I love that dog. It needs me. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the dog hasn't made that decision. All he knows is, okay, who's feeding me? Right. And, oh, you, you must like me. You petted me. Uh, but I'm going to go over here now. And now you're pulling me back. And, no, but I want to go over here now. Right. You love me, don't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. Well, somebody's got to say no. Yeah. So if you, if you can get the dog to do what you want, then the dog sees you as the leader. And the dog respects the leader, and then the love will come with any person he meets. Right. Uh, we need to take a break here. Uh, just before we go to break, I just introduced the word no into the conversation. No is a word used by too many dog owners too often to the point where it has no meaning to the dog. Mm -hmm. If you say no, and you're big on one word commands, it's all a part of the BC Canine Training Center routine. Mm -hmm. One word commands, and no is one of the most important words you can use, but you, can, you, you need to use it sparingly and you need to mean it and have consequences when you do, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, otherwise what good is it? And so... No, no, no means maybe? Exactly. No means yes? No, no, no means what? Mm -hmm. No means nothing if uh, if uh, you don't reinforce the the behavior that you're trying to stop. And frequently you hear, no, Rover. How many times have I told you, don't go for sticking your nose in the garbage can? No, Rover. And then there's this this thing that accompanies no. Yeah. And no is pretty pretty standalone command, Phil. It, it has a lot of merit all by itself. Yeah. And, and it has to be said... Uh, at the appropriate time, and that's when something is going on, not after. Right. You don't walk into the kitchen five minutes after you know that the dog's been in there, see garbage all over the floor, and start giving the dog heck for it. Yeah, right, right, exactly. The dog's making no association. Right. You know, you're pointing to a piece of bread that's in the middle of the floor. Right. The garbage is over there. That's where he got the bread from. Right. Hauls it over here, and five minutes later, you're pointing to a piece of bread and telling him no? Mm -hmm. That's ancient history. What's that got to do with the garbage yeah. that's over there? He doesn't know. That's right. Our guest is Phil Moriarty, the owner of the BC Canine Training Center at the foot of Number 3 Road in Richmond and online at bccanine.com. Lots more ahead on Experts on Call. Stay with us. We're right back after this. Delivering relevant and beneficial consumer information. This is Experts on Call. And there's more still ahead on AM 650.